Quiet, please. Quiet, please. <laughs> American Broadcasting Company presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for today is called My Son, John. Shakespeare, King Henry IV, Part One, Act Three, Scene One. Owen Glendower, the Welsh warrior, says, I can call spirits from the vasty deep. And Hotspur replies to him, Why, so can I, or so can any man. But will they come when you do call? They come when I call. I've tried it only once, though. I don't think I shall try it again. Well, there's nothing to be afraid. It's still light outside. Sunset was only two minutes ago at 4.31. There's nothing to be afraid while there's still light. But later, we'll come to that. It was a year ago last Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, that my son John died. I'm a very lonely man. Some of my contemporaries insist that I'm a very hard man. Perhaps I am. But in my own defense, let me say that my hardness is possibly engendered by the fact that I've been so embittered and lonely for so very long. My wife, whom I love very greatly, died three months after my son John was born. For a long time, I lived with my son John alone, except for the necessary servants, medical attendants, and the like. I saw none of my friends. I allowed my business affairs to drift into the hands of my associates. I refused to see my friends. And gradually, my friends fell away from me. I lived for all those years, almost to the cliff. But my son John was a joy to me. I denied him nothing. He had friends. He loved life. And he lived it to the utmost. When the war came, my son John was much too young for service. In fact, it hurt him tremendously. And he exacted a promise from me that should the war still be going on, he would enter the service on his 18th birthday. His 18th birthday was two years ago. And though my heart was wrung at the thought, I allowed him to enlist in the army, gave him my blessing. And I could deny him nothing, not even this. And I hoped hard that he would not be sent overseas. But my hopes came to nothing, for within eight months he was sent to Austria. And scant four months later, my son John was dead. try to describe to you my grief. It is overpowering. Let me simply say I was inconsolable. I had never forgotten my wife, my beautiful, beloved wife who had died and left me with a taste of ashes in my mouth. But she had left me, my son John, as a consolation. Now my son John was dead. And there was nothing left to console me. It's not surprising, I think, that I turned to the account for relief. There was a woman. Let her be nameless. She too is dead now. She was a very wise woman, skilled in things beyond the comprehension of the material world. I sat with her many nights in this very room, speaking to her of my love for my son John and of my unutterable loneliness. And then I came and I said to her, Listen. Listen, I said. Can my son John, is there a way to call him back to me? Tell her, please. I have been treated very unfairly by life, I think. I have been robbed of the only two treasures that life gave to me. First, my wife, now my son. I have tried to reach into the other world to have your son speak to you through me. Why haven't you succeeded? Perhaps you do not believe in me. Yes, I think I believe. You must believe completely. I cannot succeed. I tell you, I do believe. Yes. Yes, I think you do. Well, then... What? Then what other reason can there be for not reaching him? You say you don't know how he died. No. 
to say, Steve. That's so strange. I don't want to know how he died. I don't understand. Didn't the government... I had a letter that told me that my son died, that they would send me the tales of his death. When that letter came, I tore it up without opening. I didn't want to know the details. But you can write and ask me to send the details again. I mean, you can explain. No, I don't want to know how he died. There's not much I can do, then. You know where he's buried? No. I would have to know that, I'm afraid. That can be the only explanation of why I have not been able to reach him. Isn't there any other way? It would be easier to write and find out. No. No, I will not do that. Then? No other way. There's a way to do anything. And? It's dangerous for one who is not in a depth. What? You're in a depth? Aren't you? I am. But you're not. What do you mean by that? I don't... You are the only one who can do it. I? I can do it? Yes. How? How? Listen to me. I can teach you. I can teach you to call up your son in a way that will bring him to you. Teach me that. Now? You may live to regret... No, 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 no. Teach me how to bring my son back. I'll pay you. I'll, I'll make you rich for life. I'll... There's no need for pay. I have my own ways of becoming as rich as I desire. Then tell me how. You may bring about your own destruction. I don't care. Let me have just a little time with my son again, and anything can happen. I have warned you. Now give me your hand and listen. She began to speak here in this very room as we sat there at that table. She spoke and her eyes burned into mine. And she told me how to bring my son John back from the grave. And that was a very simple thing to do, so simple that... No, I shall not tell you what it was I must do. It's very dangerous for one who was not a deaf, she said, and that's the reason why I shall not tell you. I must be alone, she said. I must be alone in a darkened room at midnight. And then I must do certain things and say certain words, take my hands in a certain manner, and wait. I turned out the lights at five minutes before midnight. I set my luminous dial watch on the table before me. The room was not completely dark. I hastened to pull down the window shade. And as the hands of the watch met at midnight, I did the thing I was to do, and I said the words she had taught me, and I placed my hands in the position she'd shown me, and I waited, and I heard a sound at the door, and then for a moment I spoke. Come in. Come in. Hello, Father. prevent her calling me, Father, but when you called, there was no other way. John. Yes, Father. I have come home. I did do it then. Yes. And nothing happened. She said it was dangerous. You haven't seen me yet, Father. Turn on the light. No. We'll talk first. Talk? John, it's a joy to hear your voice. I'm not happy about this, Father. You should have left me where I was. No. John, if you can imagine the loneliness, the terrible yes, answer. I can imagine. And... You're not glad I called you? No, Father. Well, I see that you're made happy, John. You'll have everything your heart can desire. How do you know I didn't have everything I wanted before you called me? Well, I mean, were you happy? No. No, not happy, but I did have... No, I don't know. John, where were you? Where were you, John? Father, I... Deserted from the army. You deserted? Yes. Well, if you deserted, it was still very good. Not for the last But I want to see you. Well, talk first. Well, but I really had no intention of deserting at first, Father. I had two days leave and I went exploring. Did. Were you. Uh, I mean, did the guards go? Or... No. No, I was in a part of the country where I wasn't supposed to be, of course, but. 
Everyone was very kind to me. Well, what? I was walking along a mountain road early in the evening. I didn't know exactly where I was. Then I saw the lights of a big house a mile or so ahead of me. And I decided to stop there and see if they could put me up for the night. Did they? No. Just as I turned into the driveway that led up to the house, a, a dog came running out from the shrubbery. Before I knew what was happening, I'd been knocked down and the, the dog was at my feet. Oh, John, oh, horrible. In the morning, I woke up lying by the side of the road. I was pretty weak. And I tried to crawl out, hoping somebody in the house would come out and help me. But I couldn't see the house. The thing had dragged you away. And after a while, I felt strong enough to stand up. And I staggered down the road. And a couple of Russian soldiers in a jeep picked me up. And somehow or other, I got back to where I was taken. My mm-hmm. poor boy. But now, John, and I died two days later. And then I woke up in the house. The big house I'd seen when the dog attacked me. And I was lying on a couch. And the dog... It wasn't a dog, but It was a wolf. The wolf was sitting alongside me, talking to me. So I stayed here all the time, except at night, until you called me. John, weren't you... I mean, didn't you... Didn't they tell you in the letter, Father, that my body disappeared? I didn't read the letter. You should have. Perhaps you wouldn't have done this thing. Because now... Now I can't be dead. Unless... Unless, well, there's a way. But you wasn't something I can do, you mean? Yes. Tell me, John. Tell me so that I... I mean, if there's something that I might do inadvertently, something I might do without thinking, I, 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 I'd want to know, so I wouldn't do it. No, Father, this is something you can't do inadvertently. Are you sure? Yes. Yes, I'm sure. Do you want to tell me more? So we can... It's been so long, John... We can do so many things together. Shall I turn on the light now? Have, have you got used to being back? You'll have to turn them on eventually, won't you? Well, of course, I can't see you in the dark. I can see you. You can. You haven't changed much. I'm thinner. I've changed. I suppose you have, but... Will you turn on the light, John? I can't get up this day. The shock of your death, you know. I had a little stroke. I'm sorry about that. But now you're back, maybe it'll be better. Oh, John, it's so good you're back again. Turn on the light. Please? Well, shut your eyes. You can open them after I've turned on the light, when I take it. All right. Keep them closed. Now, open them. I opened my eyes, and I didn't believe what I saw. For my son John was not in the room with me. But a great, light gray wolf stood inside my chair, stared at me curiously. Of the eyes of my son John. I can call spirits from the back deep, deep. I said to myself over and over again, I can call spirits. She warned me against it, I said to myself. She warned me, and I did it. My son, John, I thought. My son, John. And I spoke the words aloud. My son, John. And the wolf came over to me and made a paw on my knee and spoke. I'm sorry, Father. I told you I wished you hadn't done it. Are you... Are you John? Of course I am. Would I ever see you as you were? No, never. Mm-hmm. You see, Father, she told you how to do it. I had pity on her. I wouldn't come when she called me because I was afraid of justice. I heard her talking to me, but I didn't answer because I wanted to spare you this, Father. I'm... I'm glad I did it. Oh, John, welcome home, no matter what shape you're in. You see, Father, there's a catch in everything. Most of the things you've heard about, superstitions, old beliefs, all that, most of them are true. But 
what people don't know is that there's, there's always a catch. It's much better not to meddle, Father. I'm not sorry, John. It would be much better if you hadn't done it, Father. I love my son, John. I love you a great deal, Father. I loved you enough to make myself stay where I was until you made me come here. What can I do for you, son? Nothing, Father. There must be something good. Well, you are alive, aren't you? Well, I mean, would you like something to eat, perhaps? No, not anything. Well, I came as a wolf because I was more used to being a wolf than anything else. You mean you can be yes. I can change myself into almost anything. That's one of the things he taught me. A bird, a bat, or a cat, or a Who is he? Well, you've heard of him. No. Most people think that Bram Stoker invented him. But he's fiction. But he isn't. Bram Stoker doesn't mean he's familiar. Of course. He wrote a book once. A book called Dracula. You see, Father... We exist. There are thousands of us on here. More than anybody has any idea. And we're all alike. We're not alive. And we're not dead. And there are more and more of us every year. Because when someone dies, I mean, when one of us finally kills a person, that person becomes one of us too. John. And it's not bad, Father. It's not bad at all. Did you ever hunt? Well, we hunt. We hunt the greatest game of all mankind. Ah, I can tell you. John. Yes, Father. Tom, now that you're here, here in New York, I mean, will you... I mean, will you hunt here, too? How else can I exist, Father? Tom, no. I'm sorry, Father, but that's the way it is. What have I done? You had plenty of warning. Then... Go back where you came from. No, I can't. I'll be with you forever, Father, until you die. No. He warned us, remember? Well, won't you change yourself into your own shape then, at least? That's the one shape I can't assume. It's one of the catches I told you about. Oh, I'm sorry, Father, but even if I could, I, I don't think you'd want to see me. Before you put this spell on me, I could have filled my own shape whenever I wanted to. And I remember, people didn't like it. They all screamed and ran. <laughs> but I always caught the home. I'm sorry, Father. You brought it on yourself. If you'd let well enough alone, I'd never have bothered you. I'd have stayed there with Dracula. And that's the way it is. But no, I'm sorry, Father. I've got to leave you for a while. Where are you going? Why, I'm going hunting. No. No. Sorry, Father. I'll be back. I'll always come back, Father, so don't worry about me. And before my eyes, the mean gray wolf vanished. And I heard a fluttering sound. And a huge black bat was flying out the open door. I endured my son, John, in numb horror for so long. I grew accustomed to finding a black dog snarling away all day long in that corner over there and lazily waking up as darkness began to fall. I learned not to disturb the sparrow that slumbered through the daylight hours on the top of the bookcase there. Sometimes it was that same gray wolf lying there under the window from sunrise to sunset, growling a little in his sleep. Yawning widely as he awoke, his red mouth and cruel long fangs gleaming in the lamplight. Oh, my son John was very discreet. It's a long time before I began to notice in the papers the stories of lonely people about the city and suburbs being attacked by a ferocious great gray dog or clawed by a huge tomcat. But the stories appeared from time to time, and I knew. My son John spent less and less time with me in the nighttime, although he was always there asleep during the day. And slowly, a, a conviction grew within me. A conviction that I... I, the bereaved father, I, with the best intentions of a disordered mind, I was responsible for these murderous attacks. For had I not come back to my side this, this ravening horror that was my son John? 
I called on her. And the wise woman who had taught me the spell came to see me. A gray wolf was asleep beside the radiator, twitching and growling from time to time. And she came. <laughs> I expected you to call me long before this. I was trying to decide to prove something. Well, did you succeed? Yes, I succeeded. Your son came back? Yes. Where is he? There. On the floor asleep. Oh? I think. You warned me? Yes, I warned you. Do you know what he is? There's a cause of empire. He says he can't be killed. So? You've been reading about the attacks on defense this year. I know about them, yes. What can I do? He says he cannot die. He said that. Oh, he said there was a way, but I wouldn't do it. Don't you know the way? Of course not. Did you ever read Dracula? No. I see. Well, probably you wouldn't do it. Uh, what is it? Your own son whom you loved. No. No. You do it. Not I. Not I. I gave you the story. I can protect myself against vampires. I have nothing to fear. But these other people, the ones I'm that... not concerned with them. But you are. Oh, you've done a terrible thing. Tell me what to do. Do you think you can do it? I will do it. You will drive a wooden stake through his heart while he is asleep? Oh, John, my son. And in his sleep, the great gaunt ghost that was my son John stirred uneasily and muttered to his dreams as he went away from there. I wheeled myself over to the bookcase. Surely I remember the copy of dropped over there. And after a while, I found it, sat down to read it to find out how to kill a vampire. I found it. I read the details of what the good doctor and his friend did to the sleeping vampire in their coffin. I sat a long time staring at my son, John. Until he stirred and I hastily put away the book and wheeled myself back to my desk as he awoke. He wagged his tail as he stretched and got up. He went to the door. Hunting again, I said. And hunting again, he said, he went away. Then... I got to the telephone, and I called up a man I know. And after a while, he brought me, not without want of winter hatchet, and a heavy butcher knife, and a great sack of garlic. And I sent him away, and lay down to wait till dawn, till my son John should appear again, and lie down to his last sleep. Three o'clock in the morning, I heard the patter of feet in the hallway, and in a moment the door opened quietly, and a little white Celian dropped in and jumped up on my bed. My son John was home early. Well, Father? Yes, sir. I wasn't asleep this afternoon. I heard what she told you to do. I watched you go to the bookcase and get that book and read it. John, you were reading How to Kill Me. Well, John, I... Well, you remember she said she knew how to protect herself against vampires. Yes, yeah. she didn't. John, what? She won't bother me anymore. What did you do? I killed her. Oh, no. I was a lion, and I clawed her, and I bit her. Now she's one of them. And she's sorry she told you how to kill me. And she did. Of course, darling. And I looked. And a tiny white cat sat on the foot of my bed, washing her face demurely with an elegant paw. And I reached for my son's throat, and the little cat sprang at me with a wild yell. And my son John pushed her away. He sat there for a moment, laughing at me. And then he settled down beside me. And he said, Father. And I listened. And listened and listened. And once in a while, she put in a word, too. And as the night wore on with John's stories of the greatest of all hunts in my ears, and the thoughts of never dying unless... And John seemed to read my thoughts. But he jumped off the bed and trotted to the place where I'd hidden the knife and I had to nail it in. And then in a minute, a great, tall gorilla came back in my room with the things, and he laughed, opened the window with his great hands, and threw them out. 
Then he turned around to me and said something. He was a little female again. He jumped up on the bed beside me. He whispered in my ear. Come on, Father. What about it? And I said, well, at least I'll be with my son forever and ever. And it sounds like a better life than sitting in a wheelchair and feeling guilty. And I said, do you feel guilty, son John? Not at all. Do you? Of course not. Well then, will it hurt much? It hurt for a moment when I felt those sharp little teeth in my throat, but it was over very quickly, and I thought, I ought to be a dog, too. And I felt something funny. She and John laughed, and there I was, a, there I was, a big, flavoring great thing. And I said, why, this isn't bad at all, is it? <laughs> and we laughed and laughed and laughed. Because now, now I've got my son John back. And we'll be together forever. Yeah, but really forever. And I've discovered that hunting is really fine. Maybe my son John and I will come hunting you that night. Today's Quiet Sea Story was My Son John. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Cattle. And Warren Stevens played John. The woman was Kathleen Cordell. Music for Quiet Leaves, as usual, is played by Albert Brennan. Now, for a word about next week, here's our writer director, Willis Cooper. Thank you for listening to Quiet Leaves. For next week, I have a story for you called very unimportant person. And so, until next week at the same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. And now, a listening reminder. Three signet rings are the clues left in the mysterious disappearance of three men. You can learn what happened when David Harding, counter spy, investigates the case of the Three Ring Murder this evening on your ABC station. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Spooky Ventures is the home for spooky content and spooky merchandise on the web. Check it out today at SpookyVentures.com. And remember, always keep it spooky.